please. Okay. Good morning and welcome to Cal's Library Committee. Um, we are looking at H551 uh, um, regarding uh, racially and religiously restricted covenants. Um, and I see Attorney Dan Richardson is here. Um, hi, Dan. Um, I know you have a morning. time crunch, um, and we we're not familiar with the bill, but um, is it best for me to turn it over to you to give us a big picture and how we got sure. to this? Bill? Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Richardson. I'm the city attorney for the city of Burlington. Um, and uh, before that, I was in private practice in Montpelier. Um, I appreciate you very much uh, taking up this bill uh, and inviting me here today uh, to speak about it. I think this is a particularly important bill. Uh, what, it, what this bill seeks to do um, is to put a legal force uh, behind a longstanding court decision regarding uh, racial and religious uh, covenants in land records. And uh, I see that Jim Knapp is, is also here. And I know that if there's anyone who knows anything about land records in Vermont, Jim, I will always defer to Jim Knapp about it. Um, and I think he's had the most experience, but you know, what, what I uh, understand is that, um, you know, what history shows us is that for a period of time, um, as endorsed by the federal government, a number of properties included these uh, religious and racial covenants, restrictive covenants, saying who you could sell your property to. Um, and perhaps the most famous Vermont example is, is to be found in Greensboro. Um, the former uh, Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, William Rehnquist, uh, owned a property that had a religious restrictive covenant on it, that people of the Jewish faith, uh, the property could not be sold to the individuals of the Jewish faith. Um, now, these covenants are legally not enforceable under a US Supreme Court decision known as Shelley versus Kramer. So it's not as if anyone can go into court and enforce these covenants. Um, what this bill aims to do, however, um, is to void these covenants as a matter of law, which is something Shelley versus Kramer does not do. Um, so this is an additional step, and I think it's a secure step that's necessary because Right now, there is a court decision that says we can't enforce these, but it doesn't say these are per se illegal. Um, it just simply says these violate uh, fundamental standards uh, of, of you know, due process and equal protection so that a court can't be a, a, a body to that. And I think the, the weakness of that is that in some day, there may be a revisionary thought uh, in, on the court. Um, and the fact is, is that if these things exist, um, and private parties seek to enforce it privately, uh, they remain on, on the books. And there is no law in Vermont that says these are illegal and that they are void uh, and null of effect um, as part of any deed. Now, I think what also Jim Knapp will, will tell you is that we don't see these cropping up in current deeds. These are largely historical from a certain time period. And, and I think that's that's good, but I think you know this is the idea of putting the nail in the coffin, and to put these these uh, covenants fully fully down uh, as something that we as Vermonters cannot allow uh, in our state. And so the bill itself is 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 relatively short, but I think it's effective. Um, I've talked with members um, of various uh, title companies of the Vermont Bankers Association of. Uh, the Vermont Bar Association about this. And I think we've gotten the language to a point that it's, it's acceptable to these parties. What it effectively says is that, you know, a deed, mortgage, plat, or other recorded device recorded on or after July 1st of this year uh, shall not contain a covenant, easement, or other restrictive or reversionary interest purporting to restrict ownership or use of real property on a basis of race or religion. So it just outlaws any type of device going forward. And then part two uh, says that any, any such device, covenant easement or restrictive or reversionary interest in a deed, mortgage, plat, or other recorded device purporting to restrict ownership um, is declared contrary to the public policy of state of Vermont and shall be void and unenforceable. So if there is one in the land records and we know that they are there, um, 
you know, and we know that in fact it was it was federal government policy to encourage such covenants. Um, they are effectively rendered null and void as a matter of law. And, and I think what this does is then just simply closes the book on this. The statute goes on uh, to then offer what's known as a certificate of release. Um, that if somebody wants to take the affirmative step of of releasing this covenant or interest in their land to take it affirmatively out of their land records, they have the ability to do that under this certificate. And it's it's intended to be an encouraged uh, document, not a required one. Uh, there's no fee if uh, somebody fills out this certificate. And this language is based on what other states have done. Most, most predominantly Virginia has enacted very similar type of legislation uh, as a way, but, but a number of states have gone in this direction. I think as a, as a way of recognizing that this is just simply an evil uh, device that we as a society you know, do not wish to have in any way, shape or form continue. Um, in, in our land records or our legal process. And so uh, the certificate, I think, is, is really just an affirmative step. It doesn't, uh, I think it just further allows a person to distance themselves from this particular type of, uh, of covenant uh, that may rest in the back pages of their land records. Um, and so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, there's really those three small parts, but I think they're really powerful and effective parts. And I, I certainly appreciate this committee considering this bill. Um, the reason Burlington is involved is that out of probably all the cities in, in Vermont, um, we are the one that is most likely to have these in our land records um, in larger numbers, simply because we have a larger population base, but also because uh, a lot more federal funding for uh, housing in the uh, early 20th century was spent in Burlington. So, um, you know, I think this is important for us as we as we come to this reckoning with these issues. So, I'm happy to take any questions that the committee may have. And again, I certainly appreciate you taking this up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. So, I do see two hands, but before I get to the folks, um, can you? I know you mentioned um, BT bankers. Um, BBA title lawyers, can you um, tell us a little bit about the processes, how we got to this to this draft, please? Sure. Um, I, so I worked with uh, Ledge Council uh, on on drafting this. Um, then it was circulated to these various groups to comment on, and there was one piece in here, and I think it's it, it's it's uh, worthy of mentioning. You know, I had worked with uh, the city the city's. Uh, REIB department, the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department, and you know, talked with them about this. They fully supported this bill. Um, they had proposed language that they felt um, you know, was worthy of inclusion regarding uh, some of the historic context. They wanted to have language that said um, you know, that even if you remove this, this, uh, this clause from a deed through the certificate process, that you include language to say, hey, this property once had this, this covenant on it. And um, you know, in talking with title insurance companies and talking with the Bankers Association, um, I think their fear was that this would become a cloud on title. And I don't think that was the intent of the parties uh, to put that in there. So you know, I certainly agreed to, to move off of that language. Um, I think because the greater good, I didn't want the perfect to be uh, the cause of, of removing this, this substantial good, because I think this is something that really should have come long before now. Um, but um, I wouldn't want to be the reason for delaying it any further. Um, but, you know, it is an important piece that I think is out there and we can address it another time, you know, that we don't, this is not intended to remove the history of these covenants, because I think it's an important part of recognizing and coming to, um, you know, an understanding uh, that that this these represent actual economic harms that were uh, inflicted upon uh, religious or racial minorities. Because you know whether or not it was ever enforced, it essentially was a "you're not welcome here" sign um, that that stood in in the way and and was prom promoted again by the federal government. And I recommend to anyone who hasn't 
uh, Richard Rothstein has a wonderful right. book called The Color, Color of Law that really details the, the history of this. And, and certainly that's part of the reason that inspired me to work with the REIV department about uh, promoting this and, and certainly is part of the city's uh, awakening and recognizing this is something that needs to be remedied. Thank you, Dan. So the um, so the language that you were talking about was in the bill is introduced, correct? And it's not correct. here. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It's been removed. And, and with that, my understanding is that these various groups are, and I would certainly, you know, defer to Jim Knapp uh, if he wanted to clarify this further. But my understanding is that the various title insurance uh, entities, as well as the VBA and the Bankers Association, who, you know, obviously represent the banks that are giving out mortgages on, on these properties, that they're satisfied with the version that is before you today, um, that this, they have no objections or, or issues with it. And that as a result of their, their review and vetting, I think this is a, a bill that should receive no, no um, objections. Thank you. Um... Tom, and then Barbara. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I, I guess I'm curious or and confused, I guess, a little bit as to why existing dis discrimination laws wouldn't uh, stop that from happening. Well, I think, you know, it's it's a matter of in enforcement. And I, I would agree fully <laughs> with you uh, that, uh, you know, in part, this wouldn't be able to go forward, which is to say, if somebody had one of these covenants and they sought to enforce it, I think there are a number of protections out there. Um, and I by no means suggest that this is somehow an ongoing or current issue where people are refusing to sell their property because they feel legally bound. This is more, as I said before, the sort of nail in the coffin, which is um, you know, we have these, we have these discriminatory laws and we but it's Again, these are private citizens, these are private covenants, and they were originally drafted for private enforcement. So the minute there is a ruling that these are essentially private parties, as was the rule of law prior to 1949, um, these go back potentially into effect. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the, it's a slight danger, but I, I think it's an unnecessary risk. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Barbara. Barbara. Um, so thank you for a great explanation. I'm, I'm wondering a couple of things. This just deals with residential. Is that right? Did I uh, see that? It does, it does not. Um, it, okay. it says a deed, mortgage, plat, or other reported device. So, so it, it's not restricted. And so I'm wondering a few things. One is, um, and I'm just trying to think about Burlington in particular at the moment, for example, the YMCA, um, or I'm thinking about fraternities, not that, um, believe me, not that we should allow places that want to discriminate based on race or religion, I'm wondering about ones that are uh, sort of border, they're kind of borderline, and it may be because of funds that purchased it, like uh, Ruggles House, which does it based on age, I'm thinking, probably and originally based on occupation, which again, it may be that it's an occupation that is not traditional, you know has been not open to people of a religion or a race or um, group homes that are run by nonprofits that have a religious bend and only accept uh, clients that are a certain religion. Some of them may or may not have, I'm, I know probably bigger than Burlington, some of them likely have properties in Vermont. Will this, will this apply to them as well? It, well, it, it, it will, but I, I don't think that it will have a negative impact. And, and I'll ex explain this way. Um, you know, this very much deals with restrictive covenants dealing with ownership, saying you may not transfer to someone of this religion or of this race. Um, and I, 
don't understand either fraternities or um, any of these charitable nonprofits that have religious affiliations, you know, that, that they may have, so for example, the Catholic Church is a, is a good example. Um, you know, they may have canonical law that requires a certain interpretation as to how this would, uh, would transfer. And, that's, and that, won't, that won't be affected by this. Um, anyone seeking to own a property as a charitable, religious, or um, you know, uh, otherwise restrictive organization, this won't affect them. It just is when they go to transfer the property, when they sell it, there's nothing that they can point to in the deed itself that's recorded in the public land records that requires them to discriminate. Um, and but that's what these covenants are. Okay, so if, if for example, uh, um, a charity that is funded by a church um, has a covenant on there that it will only, because I know usually like with nonprofits, it's got to, sometimes it's got to go to another nonprofit or whatever, um, but it won't, they would not be able to say this must go to another Christian what, when it's sold, it must be transferred to a Christian leaning uh, or organization. Not, not by terms of the deed, but again, if, if they have an organization and I'd say like, for example, with the Catholic church, you know, there may be an ownership requirement that if any transfer occurs within the owner, that they may have a requirement that it be sent to another Catholic organization, um, you know, goes from the Franciscans to the Jesuits or something of that sort, that, that is outside of the land records, um, and that wouldn't be affected by this. But if there is a deed, so for example, you know, you had a, a, a YMCA type building, and the YMCA deed said, this may only be transferred to another Protestant organization, um, this would be rendered null and void. That would be rendered null and void within the deed. Now, they may have corporate bylaws, they may have certain charitable organizations, and I can say I've been involved with charities that have priorities for, you know, if they're selling, you know, if you're involved with the Scouts and they're selling a camp, they may sell it to something, some organization that has a uh, conservation mission. Um, that's not in the deed, it's just simply in the mission of the organization. And there's nothing in this bill that would affect that um, that type of purpose. It just would be that you couldn't put it into a deed uh, sort of to reach beyond either the grave or, or outside of uh, the bylaws of the organization uh, to, to require this on strictly racial and religious grounds. And what, why, not, why wasn't, I'm just kind of curious why like um, sexual orientation or gender are not part of uh, the language, like why not sort of make sure protected classes are covered? I, I think, well, so the reason that I, I chose the language, you know, and, and worked with the Ledge Council on this is that these are the categories that traditionally have these type of restrictive covenants, historically and, and actually. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of um, bans on, on uh, gender, but, you know, if, if you wish to put that in there and wish to add that, those protected categories, um, I think those, the, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have any problems with it, but I think the purpose of this, this act was really, first and foremost, to direct, to directly address the, the specific historic context. Right. When you talked about the future, it made me think about, like, whoa, let's... Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Dan, I know you have a, I think you have a, you've had a hard stop maybe. Do we, do you have time for any other questions? Or? I, I, I do have a, I do have time for a few more. I, I apologize, but uh, yeah, I can, I've, I've let the mayor know I'm going to be late for the next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Uh, in reference to H551, obviously what we're talking about, where it specifically mentions racially and religious restrictive covenants. I don't know how many of those exist in the state of Vermont. Uh, and they probably shouldn't is that exist. However, are these going to be treated on an individual basis? Who, so to speak, is going to be the judge and jury as in defining 
what is racial and what is religious covenants and how are you going to determine that individually? Sure. Well, what this will become is a statute on the books so that, um, you know, and my hope is, is this, is that this statute goes onto the books and is not ever have, has to be used because we don't have somebody who's attempting to restrict the transfer based on any of these bases. And, and, and I think practically speaking, Shelley versus Kramer does a lot of that. So this is really a, a, a belt and suspender approach. But if it did come to a point where it had to be enforced, I would expect a court would be able to do that. And what would happen is, you know, somebody would, would attempt or would have refused to sell a property based on these bases. Uh, and this would become yet another tool in the toolbox. Um, so if somebody, for example, claimed in, in a private sale, well, I didn't sell it to you because there's this restrictive covenant. Um, you, if you were the one who would not, was not sold to, you would have a cause of action uh, because they violated a state statute that says you can't do this. That's null and void. Uh, and to the extent you have any contractual rights or you have any declaratory rights, um, you would go to court and a court would sort through the determination of whether this was a racial or religious uh, covenant. So it is going to be based on an individual effort, obviously, but through state statute. Are you Correct. familiar personally without naming any, any of these that exist within uh, the city of Burlington? You know, I, I haven't done an, a, a full search of the land records, as you can imagine, and we don't have them called out. Um, I know our REIB department has, was one of their goals for this coming year was to start to identify which properties in Burlington. My understanding, and Jim Knapp may actually be able to answer this question much more directly and succinctly, my understanding is that there are a, uh, you know, there are more than one uh, there are probably uh, several dozen of these scattered throughout that, but that they all predate, they're probably earlier than 1960 um, uh, because the practice seemed to have ended in Burlington uh, within most of our, our adult lifetimes. Thank you. And Dan, as you said, um, there wasn't in Greensboro, mm -hmm. right, this is Frank West. Um, and, and others, yeah. Uh, okay. Didn't we deal with something like this a year or two years ago with Montpelier or something? <clears throat> Wasn't there something in there about the same type of thing? Uh, or am I badly mistaken? I don't recall. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's, there's something because there's this sticks out to me. Yeah, well, um, when, we, when we hear from Eric, he can, he can tell us because he's the on most of the property. Okay. Not so much a question, but just really a comment to thank you for your work and to to thank the REIB department. I know, you know, clearly this is important to Burlington, but I really appreciate you kind of raising it to the level of a state <coughs> issue. And and just to Ken's point um, and to the the chair's point, you know, it's clearly Burlington is not alone in having these kinds of um, these kinds of deeds and clauses, and just I'm just really really grateful to you all for bringing it forward. Proud, makes me proud of my city, but I think it's important work. <laughs> well, I'm ha happy to do it. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Good to see you, Dan. Good. Thank you all. And if there's any other questions, I can certainly be reached by email. And I really appreciate. Again, I'm, I'm grateful for this committee for taking this up and I appreciate you making time. So thank you. Great, thank you. Great, take care, thanks. Okay, Eric. It's, it's, good morning, Eric. Hi, good morning, everybody. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks, you too. The, uh, the I was able to listen to uh, Dan's background explanation of the bill. And uh, oh, by the way, this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to do a walkthrough of H 551, uh, which as uh, the committee just heard is an act relating to uh, removal of restrictive covenants from deeds. Uh, 
does it make sense to take a look at the language, pull the screen up first, or uh, was there a preference for how you'd like to proceed having, having heard some background already? I think we can skip the screen sharing and have you, um, it looks like everybody has, has it in front of them. And it is on our committee page for those who are watching um, on YouTube, it's draft 2.1 of H551. Yep, exactly. It's draft 2.1. It's it's framed right now as a strike all amendment since uh, there have been some changes since the bill is introduced. Uh, as Dan explained, there was a, a group email chain uh, with myself and Dan, as well as general counsel for the First American Title Insurance Company, general counsel for the Catholic Title Insurance Company, the VBA Real Property Section co-chairs, uh, and the Vermont Bankers Association. Uh, we're all involved in um, some lengthy email discussions to try and hammer out the language. And I believe all of those parties have agreed to the language that you see in front of you now. And <coughs> specifically, uh, you'll see that if you're able to look at the, the bill itself, you see that initially there's an intent section and that just sort of lays out what I think Dan explained this morning, which is that the there was a very famous United States Supreme Court decision, Shelley v. Kramer, that held that these racially and religiously restrictive covenants and deeds were unconstitutional, uh, but that you know holding that they're unconstitutional is not the same thing as striking them from all existing deeds where they where they exist. It's just a matter of, as Dan said, they can't be enforced. They can't bring. They can't. Uh, uh, take action on the basis of one of those covenants and say, this person uh, can't sell this house to this other person on the basis of race or religion or um, probably same thing would apply to other protected categories these days. But, but that was the essence of the decision. It's from 1948. So the decision has been around a long time. Uh, and the legislative intent section sets that out and, and provides some background, some historical background as to, as to the rationale and, um, and need for enacting the legislation because this provides a means essentially uh, does two things. And if you turn to section one of the bill, subsection A1, uh, that's the first sort of substantive piece of the bill. And this, you have A1 until you have two different things that are, that are uh, going on here. First of all, uh, under A1, this says that going forward, so in the future, any, any deed or other document that uh, purports to be involved in the transfer of land that's recorded for purposes of the transfer of land. Uh, going forward, those deeds cannot contain racially or restrictive covenants. Now, covenant, as you probably know, is essentially an agreement. That's what the synonymous with the word agreement. But it applies to mortgages, flats, anything else that would contain the requirements as to the transfer of a property. And um, and there are um, uh, historically many examples of the inclusion of these restrictive covenants on the sale of the property. So what this says is that going forward, those are prohibited. They cannot be included in deeds and other documents going forward. That's A1. A2 applies to existing deeds, uh, existing land documents, transfer documents that already have these restrictive covenants. So you know the first subdivision is the universe of going forward. This applies to, well, what if your deed already has it? Um, and subdivision A2 says, okay, well, if, if the deed currently has one of these uh, racially or religiously restrictive covenants, regardless of when it was put in there, and the timing is irrelevant, whenever it was put there, if it has one right now, uh, then the restrictive covenant is void and unenforceable. So it's against the public policy of the state of Vermont, and it's void and unenforceable. Um, keep in mind that, that it's only the covenant that's unenforceable. You know the racially or religiously restrictive covenant. Not that the entire deed is unenforceable, just that piece, the piece that restricts uh, the landowner's uh, or homeowner's ability uh, to to sell that person on the basis of race or religion. That part is void, unenforceable. So you've got those two pieces of the bill uh, going forward. You can't have them if they exist already. Then they're void and unenforceable. And then you have subsection B, which is a process. Uh, for removing them. So in other words, if you have uh, a, a deed right now that contains one of these racially or restrictive uh, covenants, then subsection B creates uh, a process. And it's, it should point out here that it's intended to be, as you'll, you'll see, a very simple 
an inexpensive process for anyone uh, to remove an existing restrictive covenant. Uh, you don't, you know, he sort of, a person could do it uh, even without the statute if you hired a lawyer and, uh, you know, paid whatever money was necessary to file legal documents to uh, have one of these covenants removed. However, it's time consuming, it's pricey, it's certainly not something that uh, a citizen would necessarily know how to do without some guidance. So this subsection provides that guidance and it actually is intended to set up, as I said, a very straightforward and a not costly process uh, for anyone to do this. So uh, how is that done? Well, you look at subsection B line sort of 12 to 14, uh, the release, the, this restrictive covenant is released, this is lines 13 through 14, by recording a certificate of release of certain prohibited covenants. So that's the title of what you have to record in the land record. It's, it's on line 14. And again, it, it's uh, set out exactly how to do that. And if you continue down from starting in, say, line 15 or so, uh, this certificate can be recorded at any time, the language says. Uh, specifically says on line 17, you don't need an attorney to do it. Any person can do it. And if you look at line 18, it says a certificate shall conform substantially to the following. So in other words, a form for how to do it is set out right here in the statute. Again, the idea is to make this simple, cost-free. You, you just copy the form that you have right here in the statute, fill it out. You do have to get it notarized, which we'll see on the next page. Uh, but other than that, it's a, a process that um, any citizen could do without uh, either hiring an attorney or, or incurring any expense. At least that's the goal. So the certificate itself, if you look at it, it's a form uh, that's set out, laid out in the statute. It just it describes the property. It describes where it exists in the current land records. It, you know, it sets out who the name of the owner is. Uh, and then in, on page three, lines six through 10, it, it specifically says, um, that the covenant is released. So in other words, it shall not be of any legal force. It's released and uh, um, from the land records. And then uh, there's a notary, an acknowledgement before a notary provision that starts on line 15 of page three. Um, that's just uh, language that was that has been used commonly in the statutes when a notary is required. We have notary forms in other places in the statutes and that that language is is uh, is pasted from a, another notary form that's in the Vermont statutes. Um, so, but the notary has to sign it. There's two different forms because it, there can be a uh, a property that's owned in an individual capacity, or it could be property that's owned in a representative capacity, for example, by an institution. So, in either case, uh, the the notary has a slightly different form, but they're both reprinted there. So again, you have the forms laid out in the language so that uh, if a person chooses to, um, to take advantage of the process, they can just use the form that's provided right there and they go record it in the land records and, and it has the legal effect of releasing the covenant. Uh, another um, uh, strategy that the, that the bill proposes to make sure that there's no cost involved is in section three that starts on page four. Uh, this has to do with waiving the fee for recording the document. Typically, uh, a fee is required when, when you record a document in the town land records. Uh, but in this case, you'll see that the fee is waived when you're recording uh, the release that we just talked about, the release, the, the title of the document, the release of prohibited covenants. When those are recorded uh, to remove these racially and restrictive covenants, uh, the, the bill proposes to make that uh, cost-free so that it's affordable for you know a layperson or anyone else who wants to do it without paying an attorney. So if you look at page five, that's what the language does. It set, sets out that the no fee for show is required when you record a certificate of release of prohibited covenants, or if you correct the deed uh, uh, to remove the, the racially or uh, religiously restrictive provision as well. So... Um, and as I said, I think Dan mentioned this as well, uh, in the drafting, you know, there's a, several states that have done this, and we looked at Virginia and New Jersey, and I think Delaware as well, but there's several states that were looked at, Virginia, I think, was the primary source, but looked at several others that um, have enacted similar legislation for purposes of um, getting some thoughts for how to craft it. 
But that's essentially it as to what's what's in the language of the bill. So uh, uh, the walkthrough is um, is as I said now, but I'd ha be happy to take any questions if there were any any about the walkthrough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. This um, may not be a question for you, but um, given that we are waiving the fee, the, this bill will have to go to Ways and Means. And um, Ways and Means would likely ask, well, you know, how many properties, what are, what are we talking about? If every, you know, um, and again, I'm probably not fair to ask you that, but I, I that, that's a question that, um, you know, will be out there, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe, maybe Jim or someone from the DBA would have an estimate as to how many properties uh, this could conceivably uh, cover. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have any any information on that. I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for for Eric about the language in in front of us? No. I tell if Coach is trying to unmute himself or, or, or Coach is good. <laughs> well, I was just raising, I, I, I was trying to raise my hand, but uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Attorney Fitzpatrick and uh, Jim and Terry Corsones and Dan uh, for this great piece of work. I think to get back to the question of ways and means, uh, as indicated by Dan, um, an exhaustive search, you know, would probably take some pretty uh, deep uh, diving, uh, just because when you think of the number of potential uh, records that would have to be evaluated, um, no matter what the finding is, it's the amount of work it would take to get to that point. Uh, so from a process perspective, uh, you know, for ways and means to uh, look at a physical number, uh, I think that's gonna be kind of difficult, at least at this point in time. But that was, that was my only comment, other than thank you very much for all of your work, uh, all of those that have been involved in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Jim, I don't know if you want to answer that um, now, or um, or if not, I was going to um, invite um, Terry Carsons to uh, to testify, uh, to tell us the process. Um, but, but Jim, do you have a, a direct answer to how many properties might be involved, or help for the Ways and Means Committee? Well, for the record, uh, Jim Knapp, I'm the co-chair of the Vermont Bar Association real estate section and otherwise retired. Um, the answer is probably not very many. Um, I've done title searches around the northwestern part of the state uh, starting in 1981. And I can actually only recall one specific development, which happens to be in South Burlington, which happens to be across the street from where I live, um, that had these covenants on it. Uh, I think uh, Dan Richardson mentioned that the practice of imposing these kinds of covenants in any broad form probably stopped in the early 1960s. So, I would suspect that, that if there are even an identifiable number of properties with these covenants on them, given that it often happened only when there was a development project, so 10, 20, 30 lots created at the same time with a declaration of covenants imposed when the, just before the first sale, I'd be surprised if outside of the, frankly, outside of Chittenden County and not casting aspersions on anybody, but probably Bennington, Brattleboro, Rutland, possibly Montpelier, um, there probably weren't that many organized developments before 1960 where you're going to find these covenants. So 
my answer would be, I don't think there are going to be a lot. And um, for ways and means, I I'm guessing that on the average, um, towns collect somewhere between somewhere around 10, 11 million dollars a year in recording fees. And I doubt that the total number of these releases that are going to be rec uh, recorded in the next five years would be a rounding error in that number, much less a significant impact on uh, anybody, any town's cash flow. I suppose if some very small town with that only recorded a couple of documents a week had one of these projects and somebody showed up and recorded 10 of these at a time, it would rise to the level where someone would say, hmm, but in South Burlington, no one's going to notice. In Burlington, no one's going to notice. It'll be a very small economic impact. Beyond that, um, I'm happy to let Terry take over and talk about the process. Although I will say from the um, real estate section's point of view, um, we believe that this bill does exactly what it's intended to do and uh, have nothing other than approval for the current version. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Coach, is your hand up from before or do you have a knife? Okay, great. Thank you. So I would like to um, to, to Terry and welcome. It's good to see you, Terry. We haven't, I don't think we've seen you this year and we, and we miss your you're baking. <laughs> <laughs> Come visit anytime. <laughs> Hi, Chair Grad, and I apologize. I'm pushing my start video button, but nothing seems to be happening. But hopefully, you can hear me okay. Oh, there, oh, there we go. <laughs> Great. Nice to see you. Oh, so, so nice to see you all. I. It, and I, I, I have been over at the state house, but I got guess not in your area, and, and it's nice to know because I have seen some people kind of in the background. So hopefully I'll get to cross paths in person. But it's really wonderful to see you on screen anyway. And I apologize, um, Chair Grad. I had a previous commitment, actually, with the Vermont Supreme Court, so I wasn't didn't have the ability to change that. <laughs> So I'm sorry to have missed the beginning, and I, I hate to repeat anything that might have been said before, but uh, certainly from what I have heard, um, you know, as, as Jim said, as co-chair of the Real Property Section, is in very full support, and Eric kindly involved us with kind of the uh, fine-tuning of the drafting, and, and the present version met with everyone's uh, unanimous approval. Um, in light of or in keeping with what Jim said, I, I searched titles for about 25 years starting in 1982 in Rutland County and I, I myself personally never encountered a deed with the, the type of covenant that's the subject of this bill. Um, it's my understanding that they are rare and when they did occur it was of an era that now is most likely beyond the 40 year search. So ideally there wouldn't be an impact um, uh, fiscally. But um, we are very gratified that there's this very um, straightforward, streamlined and inexpensive and efficient way to um, uh, address a covenant if one is found. But certainly the, the bar in the real property section um, supports the bill and applauds uh, the sponsors for, um, for bringing it forth. Great, thank, thank you very much, Terry. And so in terms of, um, process my understanding is is um eric sent you the bill is introduced and then the vba if you could discuss how you, have, you know the listserv and sort of oh the, yes. the reach, uh, the, the yeah. right as well as the title insurance companies and the bankers uh the right. groups that normally would be involved with land records and they all weighed in and the final result um <clears throat> everybody expressed support for it okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Can I just ask one question about one word on line 12, where you have, um, well, at uh, line 11, it starts religious and then it go, uses the word minority. Why is the word minority in there? Why wouldn't it cover all backgrounds? Are you asking me, sorry, Representative? Sure. I think 
Okay. Yeah, to be honest with you, I that was not something that was pointed out. I don't know. Eric might have the best answer for that. It wasn't part of the discussion um, that I was involved in in terms of the mechanics. Thank you. Yeah, so Eric, thank you. Sure, yeah. yeah. Representative Gosson, that's a that's a good question. And I think it's because the the finding the sentence in that is just talking about what historically was the case. So I think historically covenants were used uh, uh, to restrict property ownership uh, by those of religious minorities. Now that doesn't mean it necessarily would always be the case going forward that it would necessarily be restricted on, on the basis of a minority. It could be, as you said, any religious uh, faith, but historically they were used uh, uh, most often against religious minorities. And I think that's just a statement of what the history was. So that's why it only says minority in that in that sentence. Well, you also had the BIPOP in there. I mean, you've covered everything. I just, I don't think that word should be in there personally because we want to cover everybody, I would think. Well, can I, as one of the sponsors, um, can I say so that, so this again is looking at um, a history of, um, land use um, sales disposition in this country where D specifically said, um, this land shall not be transferred to those of the Jewish faith or, um, or African Americans or blacks or, and those, those deeds are, you know, in Burlington and Greensboro and Justice Rehnquist of the United States Supreme Court had that in his property. So that's the minority, the word minority. You know, so well, specifically um, <clears throat> religious minorities. I mean, I'm not, it's, it's or, I mean, I'm just want to make sure everybody's covered. That's all it doesn't. I mean, I'm not stuck on it. It's just, it's just that that caught my eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, sure. Well, I think everyone is covered in that when you look at the, you know, section two, which is the, the effects of the bell, I mean, it says, uh, it says to restrict the ownership or use of real property on the basis of race or religion, period. But the section that you're looking at with that language is about the legislative intent of the bell and the repairs clinic. The historical reality of how this were used. So I would, I would support keeping that language there. Okay. That's important. But the, but to I think um, Ken, you should feel assured that the, the the bill itself. I mean, the effects of the bill are saying no restrictions in a wholesale way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good. Um, Good. I'm actually going to table that thought because you know answered uh, some points quite brilliantly that I was going to speak to. So okay, great, thanks. Uh, any other questions for Terry? <coughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you, and um, thank thank you so much for helping with this, and hope we see you soon. Oh, great. Oh, me too. Thank you. And thank you all for in, in allowing us to be involved. <laughs> you bet. Thank you. Okay, now I'll go back to, uh, to Jim Knapp. Welcome again. Thank you. Okay, working on the mute and the video. So I don't have anything to add. I'm happy to answer any questions. If anybody has any questions related to how these covenants appear in the land records or something like that. But beyond the fact that, uh, as I think three people have so far said, we had input from title insurance companies, from uh, Vermont bankers, from the real estate section. We did post this on our um, discussion board um, and there were, there were no comments other than um, approval. So beyond that, I don't really have anything to add. Thank you so much. Any uh, questions or? 
Uh, just Jim, uh, just a quick, uh, I'm sorry. And this is more for um, presentation of the bill on the floor. Um, how big is your membership now? The real estate section is 445 members, plus or minus 10. And the bar association itself is about 2,700 members. Cool. Our, our yeah. discussion board post only went to the um, real estate group. Right. So the 445. Plus or minus. Yeah. Cool. It, 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 because I, I think that's that's important for for people to to realize that you know it was all encompassing uh, of uh, those of your field that represent that area. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, question, Jim Martin alone. Um, so. In, in South Burlington, I know there's some neighborhoods that have had these like May, Mayfair Park. Uh, I mean, how, how often have you seen these outside of um, Burlington, for instance? I mean, and, and is it at all possible that you would have one that you could quickly email a sh uh, a, so we see what one of these restrictive covenants look like? Well, Quickly, no, I could run over to the city clerk's office and pull the covenants okay. for Mayfair Park. Um, well, can you describe what they say? I mean, without. Unfortunately, no. Uh, I, I remember running across this in the early 1980s when I did a title search on a piece of property in Mayfair Park. And to be honest with you, I was quite surprised to see it. I didn't realize that, that these covenants had even existed. I'm particularly surprised to find out that they exist in Greensboro, which wouldn't be a place I would have thought of either. But um, no, I can't remember the exact text, uh, but I'd be, I mean, I, I literally live around the corner from the city clerk's office. It would take 25, 30 minutes and I can find the covenants and send you a copy of that page. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that that's necessary. I don't think that's but Eric has his hand up. If you like, I have the Mayfair covenant in my hand. And uh, there we go. Yeah, uh, and as it as it happens in this small world nature of Vermont, Jim may not recall it, but it was Jim's firm where I used to work that did our closing when we bought this house. So it, that was actually in two thousand four. So that may not be the transaction Jim is recollecting, <laughs> but uh, um, that's uh, I love that in Vermont. There's like one degree of separation, but. Uh, <laughs> um, as it happens, the Mayfair Park Covenant, we were, it was disclosed to us when, uh, when we were purchasing at the closing. And right around that time when we moved in, uh, there was a lengthy process that some people were here, residents here that I got involved in when I moved in to, to have them uh, removed in the land records. So uh, they, or at least there was a, a recording in the land records that they were unenforceable and void. So it's still there, I think. Um, but we recorded something in the records to indicate that uh, obviously they were uh, uh, unenforceable. Um, but uh, uh, I can read to the covenant to you if you want to hear it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, it says, and I thought there was a religious one too, I, I, but I can't find it. The, the, the racial one I see is, no persons of any race other than the white race shall use or occupy any building or any law, except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race domiciled with an owner or tenant. And this dates from, uh, you know, Mayfair Park was exactly as Jim was describing in terms of timing. I think it was a, a it, was the, it was a subdivision created post just after World War II in the mid 1940s. Um, and so these date from, from obviously, oh yeah, 1940, September 25th, September 25th, 1940. So actually pre-World pre War II. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, do know- Madam Chair, more... Madam Chair? Yeah. Would it be too much to ask uh, to have that entered on our page? 
in reference to no, this bill? Think, thank you. I think that'd be, be very appropriate. I also know that one of our former and thank you, Eric. Yeah, sure. Purchased uh, purchased land in uh, Greensboro, and I think he purchased it with a current colleague of ours. That, so I will I will ask about I will ask that colleague if they still have it that deed from Greensboro. Yeah. I can see if um, I'm going to copy. Um, that deed from my house before it was changed because it had a covenant um, with regards to persons of Jewish heritage. Yeah, thank you. So we really appreciate that. But yeah, that when I when I bought my house two years ago, yeah. that was something that we had corrected on the deed. Yeah. And that was a process. Yeah, I think I, I think that'd be really helpful. I appreciate that. Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. And, well yeah. So, so Ken, that that's what the language um, in section one referred to. That's exactly what that's referring to. George, how naive I am. So, but I still say we we have dealt with this in my time here with something with Montpelier. I know we did. There's because I know. There's no way I would think of this. Obviously, you can tell my lack of knowledge on the rest of this. Was it like a charter chance some kind yeah, of charter change for Montpelier around some just outdated, I know it was kind of I, discriminatory language. That does sound vaguely familiar, although I don't know. It, it could have been, but it was it was with it was with the same type of stuff as what we're dealing with here. Of of, of well, I guess title change would be with the housing. Yes, I think it. Believe me, I can't think of the stuff up in just my head alone. Eric, does that sound familiar to you or? Yeah, yes. And I was, I don't know if I can track it down right now, but I think Representative Goslin is correct that there may have been a bill introduced in the Senate a few years ago um, because something came up in Montpelier. And I, I can't, it's uh my memory is similar to yours, Representative Gosselin. I'm remembering the outlines of it. I can't, I can't recall the details, but there may have been something introduced. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, put, track it down. Great. Thank you. Great. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, so we, we do have this up for um, committee discussion and possible vote. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions on this, but let's let's take about um ten minute, no more than a ten minute break because we do have a miscellaneous jury bill that we also still need to go through in this time frame. Uh, yeah, and then we'll and let's think about if we are prepared to vote on on this bill. Um, you know, I know we also have 505 later, so it's just welcome to uh, Thursday before crossover. <laughs> Should be a real short floor today. There's only two-third readings on, on the...